I did my graphic design course at Swinburne and uh, and worked as a graphic designer in Melbourne for three years in, in the company we set up, which was pretty in Rojo Graphic Design. And, and I'd worked for the whole year without a holiday and I thought, I wonder if I can get a job as a teacher. So I went into Melbourne Uni and uh, applied for a teaching position and there was one left, so I just took it straight away. Doing my teaching rounds at Fitzroy Secondary College, or it was high school in those days, one of the guys was teaching ceramics and I'd never seen it and I was... I just sort of fell in love with the material. And um, so he said, look, if you've got a bit of spare time after school, just try making a few things on the wheel. So I did. And so from then on, I um, I went to uh, t- teach half from a teaching rounds at uh, Lakeside High and Reservoir. And I, I took over as a ceramic teacher. Now, I knew nothing, but I had a pretty quick learning curve. And I uh, ended up... Yeah, doing a lot of pottery there, and then when when I moved to Gippsland, I uh, decided to get a property, build a house, and actually become a potter. So that's how it all started. When I first started out, I was making coffee cups and milk jugs and casserole dishes and all that sort of stuff that people would buy, and people would buy them in the early days. Um, but then I found when I was uh, trying to put the kids through uni and all that stuff, that I, there were certain pots and certain things that I made. Like I could I could spend an hour and a half making a tea, teapot, you know, because you've got to pull the handle, make the lid, make the spout. But in the same time, I could probably make four of those spherical pots. So I was getting four times the money for the same amount of time. I've really gone away from the functional things now into more of the artistic things, I guess. And it is an art form because you're, you're basically you're making shapes and you're painting with fire. I, you know, I also put designs on them because I was originally a graphic designer, but the you're really putting... Uh, everything you do is an art form in itself. I did my postgraduate over in, at uh, Monash, started to talk to other people that were making things, and I was thinking, oh, shit, they're nice shapes and they're nice things. So I started really experimenting with different shapes, bigger pots, and I started having exhibitions. So, and you know that that was really successful, selling a lot of pots. And but as time's gone by, I don't really make them to sell anymore. I make them just to make something that I really love. And I was used to work on perfection, and everything had to be perfect. Now I prefer the pots to show the fluidity of the clay. So. I like the movement of the clay and I like the movement of the flame. So I want to. I still want to keep pots with integrity, but I like to put marks on that are that are my marks, and I like you know to, to create glazes that I've made myself and make things that are one-offs you can't get anywhere in the world. So that's been my aim. One day I was burning off, and I had a pot that was green and. Uh, Somehow it got caught in underneath the fire. And when the fire died down in the coals was this little pot and it had turned from green to red. I was wonder how that happened. Why is it that went in green and it's come out red? And that was the start of the journey to the discovery, you know. So uh, so from then on I thought, well, I'm going to try this again. So I, uh, I had a whole lot of pots and I put the fire over it and I lit it again and then I got all these incredible colours out. So then I started to research it a bit after that. This kiln here is sort of a, was based on an anagamma kiln, which they still use in Korea to this day and, and in China and in Japan to make really unique wood-fired pots. So after being at the conference, I came home and dug a hole in the hill and then decided to try and fire it. And uh, and all of a sudden I was getting these incredible pots coming out and I thought, oh, this, this is the way to go. So um, that's where that all started. And I built this, it's, it's almost 40 years ago now, but it was it's, the design's changed quite a bit since then. It's much bigger and wider. And the results I got first up, I just can't get again for some reason. I'm not totally sure why where we're looking from here and we've got a fire and you're basically making a big chimney that goes up the hill so 
the firebox is in the beginning. Uh, in the middle part is all the kiln, and it, it, each part of the kiln is different and fires differently. And then you've got a, a flue that runs up, and then you've got the chimney that goes up from there. When you've been firing for a long time, I mean, I've been firing wood kilns now for almost 40 years, um, you, you start to learn about the atmosphere in the kiln and you get you get reduction and uh, you get oxidation and depending at the moment it's reducing so you're getting uh, virtually no oxygen and that can change copper from green to red and you get to know your individual kiln and you know where things are going to work. I now know that at the front of the chamber you'll get an ash glaze or a, a really nice colour just from the materials. So the pots I put in the front will be just probably pretty plain and they pick up all the kiln. Whereas halfway up, I might put things that have got a design I've put on them and they'll pick up the colour. And then at the back end of the chamber, I'll, I'll have the pots touching so you get blushes and all sorts of things happening. So yesterday we started in the ash pit and uh, we started with a gas burner that we had on for about three hours, I presume it would have been. And then we slowly started adding just slithers of wood from um, cypress pine was basically what we use. And then a bit of pine and a few sticks of stringy bark. And, and gradually, and this was from about three o'clock onwards, we started at 11 o'clock. From three o'clock onwards, we just started adding more and more wood. We took the gas off. And then we, by about six o'clock at night, we went up and had a bite to eat, but then we came down and started adding timber in to the actual firebox. And, and by about, uh, just slowly, we kept adding wood and, and quite substantial pieces, some probably uh, 25 centimetres in diameter, and um, slowly uh, started heating it up. 11.30, I... I put in a really huge amount of wood, got up at two, two o'clock, came down and it was completely out almost, so I added it again, went back to bed for another three hours, came down at five o'clock, filled it up again, then uh, I really couldn't get back to sleep much, came down again at about six and had a look, and then we put some more in at seven o'clock, and from now on we'll just gradually heat it up. But the, the pots had had, you know, about 20 hours of drying by the time we really started to get into it. So we'll probably fire it for another 10 hours today. And uh, in this kiln I use uh, metallic salts to get a luster. It's like mainly I use copper sulphate, but you can use stannous chloride, which is silver. And I put in seaweed, briquettes, um, different slips. Um, I might put a porcelain slip on because it's pure white and the porcelain reacts differently to say a terracotta. From now on it's getting, the temperature's getting up but it'll probably climb at, oh, I don't know, say 20 degrees an hour. So let's say the front chamber's in at about a thousand degrees. In five hours it'd probably be 1100 or maybe 1200. So from now on what I start to do is We've got to keep the reduction going, which means keep the oxygen level and the draft down a bit and make sure that the smoke coming out the, the top of the chimney is uh, dark. And, but with wood firing, it fluctuates because when you put the wood in, you get more. As it burns down, you get more oxygen. So you're trying to get uh, colours that rely on, like copper, for example, if you've got no oxygen, the glazes will go red or the surfaces will go red. If you've got plenty of oxygen, they'll go green. And in this kiln, in the bottom of the kiln, it's red. And sometimes in the top of the kiln, it's green because there's more oxygen going through the top. So we'll do that. And then I'll put some of the um, salt in it. You know, I might put it in, oh, say, 10 bombs in. And I'll put them in every second stoking of the fire. And then in the end, when I'm just about ready to finish it off, I'll uh, close the damper at the top, close it up, um, and then just let it cool as slowly as I can. But the, the nature of this kiln is that it still cools fairly quickly. And I, I get very impatient, and I shouldn't, but 
I'm going to go away because I'm better to let this cool for four days till it's completely cool and then I can open it up and I can be sure that I'm not going to wreck them because you know I used to open it after a couple of days. You never lose that passion and, and it's it's like this kiln, it's, you still feel like a kid, you know, when Santa's come down the chimney and you're waiting to see what's in your packages. But when you're opening this up, you open it up and think, oh, there's one that's just magic, you know, and, it, and that's the magic. And if you get one out of every firing that you love, you, it's been successful. It's not a controlled atmosphere, really, not, not, not like a scientifically controlled thing, which that's the beauty to me, that it's sort of spontaneous and and unpredictable you know whereas if you're firing in a gas kiln you can almost get exactly the same thing every time if you do the same thing but in here never and, and I mean that's exciting it can be frustrating too and I mean when, when you look around this place what a setting to you, you can probably hear all the birds in the background you've got your spine bills your, your new holland honey eaters all your blue wrens You've got the thrushes sing to you and you can mimic them and lyrebirds down the bottom here. It's just a magic place to be. And it, I, I just feel when I'm here, it's I just can relax completely. I, even though I work from six till six nearly every day, but I'm at peace here, you know. It, it's, a, it's a lifetime, you know, basically what you're buying is 50 years of a lifetime you know and it, it's an evolution really and creating things it's like a good wine you, you tend to get better with time you know and your skill not necessarily better but your skill level and your knowledge gets more and more so you can use that to cre create really individual pieces this is my passion and so i'll try and get couple of months a year where I can actually make things and if I can get them in a three-week block I'll really experiment with different forms and shapes and colours and clays and, and just uh, try and aim for in the last let's say it's five years end up with some just magnificent things that some people will get pleasure out of for the next 50 years maybe you know so it's uh, yeah. It's not for money now. I don't need the money anymore. It's just for the the challenge of making things that are fantastic. You know.